And a very good morning to everyone and welcome to Rejuvenate Edition 2 in conjunction with uh, World Youth Skills Day. Uh, we are happy to have all of you here today. Uh, we've got special guests in the studio or, or rather in, in their own uh, setting today. Uh, we've got uh, Rashwin Pal Singh, who is the Group CEO of BGBG Initiative and Mareka. We've got Kwek Su Yen who is the Executive Director of the Hong Leong Foundation. And we've got Dr. Paul Vinder Singh, CEO of STI College Malaysia. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. All right, without, without further ado, let's uh, kickstart with uh, Dr. Paul. Could you please uh, you know, take the stage and introduce yourself? Thanks, Andrew. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Paul. I am the CEO of Skills Technical Institute in Emberhead, or better known as SEIC College. Uh, I've been in the business for roughly close to a decade now. Uh, our idea is to make skills education sexy again, and uh, as, op as, a, as the first option for students to consider and uh, to elevate the education, skills level education in Malaysia, and uh, to include digital education with skills education to prepare the students for the future, to revamp the idea of how skills education is being taught in Malaysia, and to reach out to mainly to a lot of poor kids, uh, poor kids, B40, M40, and uh, to teach them and tell them that, you know, skills is a, it's a, it's a, that's a very big future in skills. Or you just have to believe in it, and you will go the distance in skills. We work very closely with uh, Marika and uh, HLF, and we have done some great things with, in partnership with uh, Marika and HLF. Uh, recently, we announced uh, through HLF's uh, big contribution and help, we have recently announced a scholarship program. Uh, started a scholarship program actually. And we've got 34 to about 35 kids who from a very, very poor background, but uh, very interested to pursue a dream in skills education. And uh, so far, the results have been amazing. We will share with you in this conversation. And uh, yeah, so hopefully this, this rejuvenate, rejuvenate will be able to uh, give you guys more ideas about TVET and what's happening in the world. And uh, of skills in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pao. Uh, we'll move on to a, a very close and dear friend, Rashwin, from uh, BGBG Initiative and uh, Marika. Take it away. Ooh. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. Yes, this is quite a, quite a great panel to have. Um, yes, we've worked with Andrew many times at Synapse Media, especially a lot of the digital maker work, um, right? So we've been a part of that movement. And I think it's fantastic, Andrew, to see the movement from the digital maker side of it evolving to the larger TVET conversation. So just a bit of background. I'm from BGBG Initiative and Mareka. BGBG is a social enterprise that champions sustainability. Mareka is an ad tech social enterprise. Um, we operate two maker spaces, one in Publica, one more with Taylor's University called Taylor's Mareka Makerspace. Um, we do look at digital and entrepreneurship elements within our programs. Um, so, you know, makerspaces are like TVET, but in sort of like, you know, I would say like with, you know, fancy dressing and, you know, cool outputs and, you know, making, breaking, less structured, right? Um, very much more free flowing, but still ultimately achieving the objective of acquiring skills and preparing future mindsets. So like Dr. Paul said, we have a very exciting program working with um, Suyan and Dr. Paul. So yeah, this is a great conversation. Thank you. And the rose among the thorns, <laughs> Su Yen, uh, the, oh, the, wearer of, the wearer of many hats as well. Uh, we, we're so excited to have you here today. Uh, please do, do, do share with the audience what, what, what do you do and, and what is this Hong Leong Foundation all about? Hi, good morning. Hi, thanks for having me on, on your talk. Um, gosh, the wearer of many hats, huh? Um, well, the Hong Leong Foundation is primarily a corporate foundation. We, we fund a lot of education and community projects. We have been, over the last few years, been really trying to build up our skills pillar. Um, 
and we've been working with with a few uh, many different partners but th this partnership in particular has been quite exciting because it's looking at um not just uh ushering children into into um vocational jobs but also with the help of Mareka building in some some character elements and some life skills elements you know it's all very well go getting into let's say getting your foot in the door of of, of an industry but it's a whole different level to, to be noticed and that that's a lot of what what we try to do we try to look at the whole child who's going in and not just okay you've got your skills go you know so it's mm -hmm. been um it's 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 a it's been a learning journey and it's and it's quite exciting as i'm sure the two will be sharing yeah, yeah. fantastic yeah. now now that we are all uh, acquainted um dr pao uh, yes. let, let, let's hit the road running now uh, sure. i've got to start with the the tough questions with with, with you first now <laughs> thank you for that very man. very frankly yeah. what is the current tvet situation in Malaysia like? Okay, uh, very interesting question. The current situation of TVET in Malaysia is actually, I wouldn't say appalling, but it is not where we, we aspire to be. The government has set up a TVET council. The government has got bureaucrats uh, running TVET. Like if you know anything about TVET, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a match of between trying to get the education industry to work closely with the, with the, uh, with the work industry, right? So with, with the retail industry, manufacturing industry, construction industry, so on and so forth. There's a very, very big disconnect between those two currently right now because uh, industry torchbearers are not being involved in the setting up and the running of the TVET program. So you've got people who have, uh, the government has taken a group of people, uh, send them for courses, introduce them to what TVET is, uh, you know, send them to a few countries to learn and everything, and they come back and they implement TVET. But they don't sit down with the CEOs and, 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 and the leaders and, you know, the HRs of the industries and ask them, what is your problem? How can I solve your manpower solution problem, right? What, what do I need to do? How can I help you to move forward into IR 4.0? How can I prepare you to take our youth and put them into your companies? How can we do that? Mm -hmm. that, that, is, that is not, that's not available. The government has got a six billion ringgit budget for TVET. That's huge. With that kind of money, we should not even be emulating anybody. We should be number one. You know, we should be that good with that kind of budget. But we are not. We are not nowhere close to it. You know? Not enough information is... Uh, is spread around for kids to understand, for youth to understand what TVET is, right? We still have got that perception that, you know, a, 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 a parent will take and say that, oh, I do not want my child to go into skills and vocational and, you know, all these technical studies, you know, what's the future? The future is actually very bright. They are the first people to actually get jobs compared to your conventional university students, right? Because there is a, there is a demand for, for these youths. There is a demand for these jobs. You see, uh, there is a, there's also a very large uh, mismatch currently happening in the sense that the programs that are being offered and how the, ten, the industries are being pushed forward, they, 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 don't, they don't actually sync, right? So, for example, uh, just to share a very small conversation with you, I had a, I had a talk with a very big uh, vehicle company, a car company, right? A very, very established car company. And I told them that, you know, we can, you know, we can work in some ways and we can take our youths and, you know, we can, you guys can employ and, you know, things like that. And the HR dad told me, he said, uh, yeah, yeah, sounds good. But there's one problem. I'm moving on to electrical energy efficient vehicles. You guys are still any, uh, learning uh, <laughs> a fuel combustion engine. It's like, bro, it's this big, you know, it's, it's far. Right? What, yes. what, what you're doing is far. So some of our content is old. That's another issue that we have. Our NOS is old. We are talking about, you know, some content which are 10, 15 years old or 12 to stay safe, 12 to be safe. You know, they have not been updated. Uh, they have not been uh, brought forward. But again, we are pushing. We are like, oh, you know, we want TVET to be the torchbearer. We want kids to take TVET. But when they 
go through the program, they learn the program, they come out, they don't get employed. Because that's not what the industry wants. What the okay. industry wants is, you know, what they need. Yes, Sorry, correct. Sorry, you see, yeah. Yeah, so, so Dr. Paul, I, I think you, you touch on a lot of points which we are going to deep dive into in, in a very short while. But a, anyone between uh, Rashwin and Suyen, would, would you mm. like to jump in and, or, or if you have a different opinion to what Dr. Paul has been uh, mentioning? I don't, I don't have a different opinion. I think it's important to align industry. Of course, that's why we're working together, right? Or they do all the work <laughs> and I just pay. But... Um, it's, it's, of course, it's really important, but I also like to um, underline the other side, right? That, yes, it's, it's important to make sure the children are choosing the right jobs, but it's also important to remember that um, a child needs their own freedom too. We need to look at their social emotional well-being. We need to keep all that in balance. And extreme TVET, right, could lead children to be just being seen as digits, right? Like a skill schools are factories for making the right children and that, that can be a real problem too. Um, so I think that that's, that's one thing that, that we, we, we should um, also take into consideration. And it's also in the academic world, I mean. There are a lot of schools that um, measure their, their success on academic results and they're overlooking personhood and emotional well-being. And that's even how they market 90% you know, pass rate or A's or whatever. Yeah. Mm. And that's why a lot of special education needs children aren't accepted, right? But of course, that's a different kettle of fish. So, you know, children are sovereign beings. And while we fill up our labor force and, you know, all the good things about poverty and empowerment and so on, we mustn't forget that we have to really see the child before us in, as individuals and not as digits. Um, Who is actually listening to them? Who are their people, yeah? And we have to make a stand. Are we the allies of the children or are we the allies of industry? And if we are the allies of children, we have to make sure that the, that the courses that we're matching them up with is authentically what they want. And not just because, you know, you're B40, so suddenly you, you, you have your, your options are closed and we need data scientists to so go, and, go and become a data scientist. That isn't fair on the child either. So we really need a very much more balanced approach. And I know this is a harder way to go, but it's, it's worth considering. And we have to think of, protect, the, protect the young people, right? And, and be their allies and not just an ally of industry. That, that, that's wonderfully put. Uh, in, in fact, I, I, a lot of things that you just mentioned, I've not seen it in that perspective. So, so thank you so much for sharing it in, in, in that manner. Now, uh, Dr. Paul, you, you, you mentioned very briefly earlier about how parents are still not willing to push their students into the, the, the TVET field and, and whatnot. Now, Rashwin, uh, I, perhaps I, I'll start with you. How do we break that perception? I mean, it, you know, TVET is beyond what it, it, it used to be 20 years, 30 years ago, right? So, so that was the mindset of our parents. Oh, don't go into TVET. That, that's where all the, the kids who are not doing well academically are, are going to sign up to and, and stuff like that. Yeah, Andrew, I think that's a fantastic point. And you know what? It's amazing what Sue just mentioned because it is true, right? Like, I think part of the perception is seeing TVET as a very rote or, you know, repetitive right style of work so i mean any parent if, if the vision they have is i'm going to educate my child and then put them in a factory manufacturing job that would just be a part of an assembly line no one's going to want that right and i think you know so i think that the human aspect of tibet being a skill and and how skills evolve skills change is almost never mentioned right so i think there's that aspect to it and then I think the fear of digitalization is super real because on one side, we are talking about, you know, machining skills, technical skills, hand skills. But on the flip side, I'm sure there's another webinar happening some part of the world talking about automation going to remove all of us from jobs, right? So mm -hmm. I think that disconnect also creates fear in parents or in, you know, adults. But we really have to ask ourselves, like, what is the role of human? Because we know for every machine that comes in to take place or replace more jobs are also created but different jobs right so how does tibet evolve i think dr pal and me had a good chat about parents cannot see the pathway right so they know that maybe this job is needed now 
but will they be allowed chance to pursue their passion? Will they be allowed a chance to upskill, to evolve in the industry? So I think yeah. pathways are not being drawn clear enough and that's probably mm-hmm. part of the perception issue. A- yeah. Anything to chime in, Dr. Pa? Actually, what Rash says is very true, right? We don't have like a proper solid pathway where a child can see where is he going to go forward to, right? So, and, and parents have got this issue, especially Asian parents are sitting thinking like, oh, you know, you, you got to go to a university, you know, and you have to go into doing to a degree and diploma, but they don't understand that actually TVET has got a pathway to go into university, right? So currently the Malaysian government has listed, I think, if I'm not mistaken, four universities, UTEM, uh, University of Technology, Hussein On, uh, and another two more universities, uh, uh, public universities, where they accept skills based into uh, TVET uh, in education, and you can go into do on uh, go on and do a degree, a diploma, pro- a diploma, a degree, and so on program. So parents don't understand that part because not enough exposure is being done. And I can give you a very good example, right? Every year you hear about the education fair, which is happening for all universities and private universities. You never ever hear a big effort to push skills education or TVET education on the platform. It's there, it's in a small corner at the left. Or the and right, you know what, Carl, the small corner. If you were to do a TVET career fair, it would be 10 times cooler. Because a university sure. career fair is probably looking at auditoriums and all. But if you look at a TVET thing, it's machines, it's equipment, it's, right. you know, it's so right. much more exciting if you ask me. Like, yeah. yeah. So TVET has transformed from your basic welding to aeronautics, robotics, and the aerospace agency. Now that that is something where you know you need skills force to come in and do. You know, that is what you need, right? And and there are success stories all over the world about people who are skills based who are doing this. So the engineers think of the idea, the skills guys lay out the idea for you. They build the idea for you, mm, right? Yeah. So it's not just it's not just you know welding anymore. Today we have got underwater sea welding, which is like, you know, in the whole world, there's not enough underwater sea welding uh, skills men or women. That's not enough, right? And that job pays up to $8,000 per dive, per dive. So uh, you know, parents don't know that kind of a... Uh, Andrew is considering that, that an alternate there. career right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Pu- pushing my son to, to swimming classes now. And then eventually... <laughs> you know, evolve into diving and then definitely under, underwater, underwater welding. welding. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> $8,000 per dive. I, I, I yeah. hope uh, there the, the are parents see, tuning in right now. You see, the child has suddenly become invisible to all of you guys. <laughs> 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 You're not creating authentic content there. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is so... It, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. No, I swear <laughs> not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, interesting it's important you, you for the mentioned child to be seen and heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah sorry. It, it, interesting you mentioned about uh, global success. Uh, I, I think we all know that the Germany TVET model is, is not only a, a cost-effective one, but of course, uh, as per our topic today, it's also a very industry-driven one. Now, why have we not looked into that? As in Malaysia, why why have we not looked into the Germany model of of TVET? Uh, <laughs> Dr. Pao, sorry. Yes. So, okay. So uh, yes, Germany is a is a is a successful country in implementing TVET. They have done such a good job. It's 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 marvelous how great they have done. In fact, they have got one of the lowest youth unemployment in the world, right? Especially in Europe currently. And in the world also, they've got one of the lowest youth unemployment. It's because Germany starts the process with the kid, at the, uh, with the youth at the age of uh, 50. They have a pre-qualification into uh, TVET education kind of program. So they identify the kids and they tell them like, okay, what is your interest, right? Do you, are you more hands-on? Are you more this? Are you more that? They start recognizing the, the students. And they do that across. They don't, they don't just take the, 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 the weak students in education or, you know, the, 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 the super... Uh, economically uh, challenged kids or what, they do that across to everybody. Thereafter, they put the kid into uh, industry. Uh, for example, okay, now we take uh, Volkswagen, for example. They take the kid and they put him into Volkswagen. So he learns at the age of 16, 17, with Volkswagen's experts on the factory, on the factory manufacturing floor. So one week he attends there, one week he attends classes. 
In Malaysia, it's not like that. In Malaysia currently, you have got that kind of program, which is known as uh, something quite similar to that, SLDN, but it's not as successful as that. Two reasons. It's very much controlled by the ministry. Uh, sorry to say this, bureaucrats, right? It's very much controlled by bureaucrats, right? In Germany, it's very much controlled by the industry. The industry sets the benchmark. The industry sets the technology. The industry decides how they want their future worker to come in. What do they want to train them in? And the industry pays. Although they don't pay minimum wage because the particular individual, the child, is going through a process of uh, one week of education and one week of uh, training, right? So they pay a set amount of allowance for the kid. But the, uh, fact, the, 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 the industry takes up the majority of the cost, not the ministry, you see? So that's why if you were to emulate that, six billion will eradicate a lot of problems in Malaysia industry, but channel in the right manner. Right? If you channel in the right manner, then you will do it. Then you will get it. We have graduates coming out do not know how to use machineries because they are never exposed in their colleges. They are never exposed in the training center. Because you, know, you can't expect colleges and training centers to purchase you know, 20, 30 million machinery and put it there for a student to come and learn. But when they do that in the industry, they learn. Our process here is a bit different. They come in, then after a set amount of time, then they go into the industry and learn. And by that time, the employees are not the employees are not really interested because the first day they hit the ground running they are already, the employees are already told that oh this kid has finished a, a, a diploma in, in, in engineering for example electrical wiring or engineering and when they, he, the kid goes there and he gets you know he gets bombarded with all these questions and you know I thought you are a graduate you should know they don't have that you know because they are told that this guy already has got a diploma instead to, to be fair you, to be to be fair though, Dr. Paul, there, there is a national dual training system that, that yeah, is, yeah. is recently yeah. launched. Uh, and, and yeah, SLDN, yeah. Seems like yeah. you had dual so national, it, yeah. Yeah, so it, you're, you're saying then it, it's, that's not really going great? Uh, in my simple okay. term, yes. We, 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 we get you. <laughs> All right, yeah, but, but uh, we, we also bad. had this... We also had this conversation before we went live uh, and, and, and you did also very quickly mention to us that uh, while, while the Germany model is, is fantastic, uh, it, it, they themselves, as in Germany themselves, are also struggling to, to, to kind of like, uh, you know, revamp, uh, you know, they're, they're also going through an evolution of sorts. Yeah, yeah, true. True. Uh, exactly. So the current problem, what, what, what the pandemic has created is it has created an acceleration program uh, where every company has realized that, oh man, we were not prepared for this at all. Right? We were not prepared for so many things, right? The lockdowns, the, the, the inability to work and the, the uh, control in the distance and so on and so forth. So they realized that in Germany, that though they have created uh, individuals who are talented and, and, and very skillful, but they never digitally trained these individuals for the future, right? So these, mm. these kids right now, they have got skills, they've got TVET skills, but they do not have digital skills. And the kind of work which can be done by 100 people, in a pandemic it needs to be done by only 50 people, cannot be done because these individuals are not trained digitally. So mm. that, that is a problem that, that Germany has suddenly uh, reason and, and, and faced and they're like, oh wow, we never saw this coming. Now the pandemic has brought this front to light that, you know, we need to prepare the individuals for the future and we need to train them digitally. We need to push them into digital programs. We need to give them AI. We need to teach them robotics. We need to teach them, you know, 3D. We need to teach them how do you troubleshoot, you I know, a multi-million dollar mission. An interesting thing you are alluding to is multidisciplinary learning, right? Yes. Which True. How do yeah. we incorporate that into that? Because I think yes. that's something that we've tried to do. And I think multidisciplinary learning really gives that, it sparks curiosity, right? It sparks right. curiosity, Correct. you know, and if, if you ask me really, I think it comes down to that. It's how to, to rebrand, how to reimagine so that someone feels that, okay, because honestly, at the age of 15, 16, 17, 
how well do you really know what you're interested in, right? You might have an inclination that this is good. To be fair, let's be honest, 80% is what your parents are going to tell you, right? Like what Sue was saying. So, but if, if I'm given the confidence that, okay, look, I'm into this and this is the most clear pathway for now. However, in this journey, I will be exposed to different skill sets. I would get to try out a bit of app inventing. I'll get to try out a bit of coding, a bit of 3D, a bit of graphic design, right? And if I can do that, that would, you know, constantly keep me as an exciting learner. And I think that would enhance the value of the workforce tremendously, like, and the quality of life for anyone who's going down a um, learning journey. Yeah. Which, which brings I really agree. me to the, sorry, which brings me to the, actually to the next question, uh, and, and it's for Suyen to perhaps kickstart this. Now, sure. uh, we, we, I understand there's a tri-party collaboration between uh, HLF, uh, STI College, as well as Mareka, right? And it's this program called Raw Skills. I, I think Rashwin also tapped in a little bit into multidisciplinary and, and, and whatnot. Can you tell us more about the program? Uh, sure. Actually, it's a, it's a little to um, what I was talking about in the beginning, right? Uh, we wanted to, to, um, to get, I suppose, yeah, I suppose the term is B40, B40 kids into, into jobs and to make sure that they're the right jobs and all of this. And at the same time, you know, we also hold on to the fact and we try as much as possible to see them as whole children and a whole person approach. So it's, it's not just what they're learning, but how we treat them. And, and if they actually want to do this course, you know, if they actually want to be an electrician, they actually want to be a bartender, we figure, we, well, we, we try our best to figure this all out um, so that we can respect their emotional needs as well as to empower the economic ones, right? And that, that is why it wasn't just a one-way system. Let's go and work with STI College and, and get the stream of children going through, which is what we have done in the past. And yes, they do find employment and all that. But then a part of me just felt, are we doing them a favor? You know, the ground is shifting so often that like what Rashmi was talking about, we need to build a sort of creativity, a resilience, a, a, a go-getter attitude. So we, we, we sort of uh, thought it, we have to plug that in somehow with whatever skill set they have chosen, whether it's to go and dive down and get some opals or whether it's, I don't know, I'm, I'm not really sure all the different things, right, that the kids want to do these days, um, that we have this, core um, sort of uh, life skill functionality that, that's, that, that's, that helps them understand themselves and by knowing their, what, what they want inside, hopefully they have the courage to, to go out and do it. And if they realize, oops, I've taken the wrong path, okay, never mind. Let me, it, that takes a lot of courage, right? To stop <clears throat> what I'm doing, reskill and then start again because you have some kind of income stop. And I think that every kid should have that, whether you're from uh, way down the economic line or not, you know, um, everyone should have that chance to be able to develop themselves. And so this is, this is one of the reasons why I really, really, really um, very excited with this tripartite um, thing going on here. Yeah, more than a thing, but you know, yeah. I couldn't you know, find a word. Can... You know, Sue, if I can just jump in, right? So I'll yeah, give an please. example. So last week, um, Friday, there was a... So we worked with a partner, Chewbacca, to train the kids on MIT App Inventor, right? So these are level three electrical students, right? So, so they've got their pathway with electrical. However, every Friday, they get to do new stuff, right? And the App Inventor class was amazing. So what happened was, so there was five projects. I'll just share with you two. One of it was a student who designed a simple app flow of, you know, how he had cousins who, who with his family who were not so interested in studying, who were more into games. So he came up with a simple app flow, how to gamify learning. It would be a fun quiz. And if they got it right, there would be a prize. If they got it right, then they could, a small learning thing that, so he designed a sequence of questions that had a logic flow that they could gamify a bit of learning. Another kid, um, I say kid, but they're actually like 19, 20 years old, right? He, for him, it was super cool. It was, dinner options are boring. Um, so he wanted to help his mom yeah. to ideate. So he came up with a logic flow of what do you feel like, what ingredients had in the house, and then there was a bunch of options of what dinner could be that day, yeah. mm. right? And, you know, it is, so while someone might question, like, how is it applicable to this, to electrical, but if you think about it, it's a logic flow, it's a sequence of thinking, and it just 
gives you so much more options after that. Um, you should see the video I'll share with you after this. They're super happy to learn it. Like. Uh, Rashwin, do, do share it with us as well. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure our audiences would also like to, to have a look at that and then uh, you know, perhaps see how they can also be part of that program as well in the future. Yeah, and, so, and, and, and Andrew, yes. just, just a short one. That, that, is what yep. employers, that is what employers want, right? Employers want uh, an individual that he or she is able to just not just follow instructions, but in the time of a crisis to be able to think outside the box and solve and help the employer with a lot of other problems, right? And, yes. and if you can do that, your value in the chain goes up by three, four folds because you are a problem solver for uh, organization and that's what they want. They want you to be able to, 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 to hold that skills and also hold digital education in your hand and like, you know, I can solve your issues for you. That's what employers want. You know, and yeah, yeah <laughs> you, should, you should see the video. It's quite fun, actually. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, okay, we, we, we've got a question from an audience here and, and I'm just going to quickly tap it in because uh, it, it is kind of related to what we were going to move into next, right? Uh, it, it's actually addressed to Dr. Pal. It, it says here, could you advise what digital skills shortage do you currently see? And the next question actually correlates as well. It, it's from Julia. It says, are digital skills considered TVET today? The first one is, uh, what is the digital skills knowledge which is uh, lacking, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, most importantly, I would say is the understanding of uh, coding. Coding is the core of it. Uh, AI education, coding, uh, robotics, these are the basic cores of everything that we think that digital education is, 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 is very, very important. And, in, and, and I very strongly believe the faster we start them, the younger we start them, the better it is. You know, uh, we need to push our children and our youth to understand that you need to have the basis of digital skills. You need to know what is coding, right? So during our generation, we used to go to school and they would be like, okay, tekan start button. Nampak gambar window tu tak? Buka gambar window tu. Open that window photo. Okay, this is Microsoft Word, right? But kids nowadays can do that at the age of you know, three, four, five. But coding is something that a large chunk of our generation needs to start So if you ask me, coding, AI, robotics, these are the future of the industry. They're, they're going to be the pillars of almost anything that you're going to look at, any industry they're going to look at, whether it's going to be F&B, whether it's going to be hospitality or semiconductor or whatever, these are going to be the pillars of it. Uh, do they, sorry? Yes, sorry, no, go ahead. Uh, do we have skills education uh, for di digital skills education? Uh, we have currently in the country, but it is not uh, directly into a digital subject by itself. It's the basis of it. Yeah, so it's, it's the basis of it. I can't often remember the name of the program right now, but we do have, but it's just the basic and uh, like, like a touch point entry, like computer system analysis. I think it is, Lapal. If you look at it Germany is, yeah. and Austria, they do consider digital skills, like web development and all that, as part of a TVET um, course already. It is, it is, yeah. It, it, it is considered part of the TVET course, but mm. uh, as a training center itself to be able to lay out the program without external help, I don't think so. It's, it's, uh, ah, unless, okay. unless, uni unless universities are to step in and, and, and you know, accept and, and help the students, then yeah. Because uh, if, if you were to compare the, 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 the budgets and the machineries, we are on the lower side a bit compared to how universities and all can, can take it further. That, that's my point of view. That's my point of view. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Rashwin and Suyen, th there is also another exciting uh, collaboration between the two of you in terms of a Magic Panjana SIM grant initiative, right? Uh, which is a, a, a scholarship program for B40 communities. It, it's, it's called HLF Go Digital, uh, and as well as Marika's Digital Entrepreneur now. Rashwin, perhaps I start with you. What, what is all that about? I, I think it kind of lead uh, from, from the question earlier, whether digital skills are considered TVET today? Yeah, um, no. So that program is correct, called HLF Go Digital. And so it's quite fun. Um, and I'll tie this to the branding question, right, earlier about how do we 
create perception for Tibet. Um, so that program has two pathways. One is a graphic design pathway. One is a digital marketing pathway. And students come in, youth come in, they go through a three-month program. We, work, we use LinkedIn learning modules for this. So it's actually available for anybody online. So check out the Microsoft Global Skills Initiative. You can access that. It's content available till end of the year. So once they do that, <clears throat> but that wasn't the most exciting part, right? For them, it was the opportunity of, we would open up their doors to, for them to look at possible Hong Leong Foundation or Hong Leong group opportunities. And we also brought in 20 career partners for them to be attached to. And that was the selling point, right, for the youth. So for 40 spaces, we had about 200 applicants. For 20 companies, we had 80 companies who signed up who said they wanted to get this youth on board. Mm. And it was quite a nice, simple program. They, they, they would intern with a company for six weeks and they would apply what they've learned with this company because they also need to help SEs. So, so we are very big on social enterprises and NGOs and a lot of them lack resources for digital skills. So how do we match youth with digital skills with NGOs and SEs? And the Hong Leong Foundation basically helps us to facilitate that. Yeah. And I, I mean, just as a small plug, for anyone, we only need about four or five uh, cohort to start any program. And it's any program in MOJR, as long as they're B40, there is a plug-in at the end of a company, we can run. So, you know, really just, if you, if you have needs, you can just contact us, of course. A little plug, but. Oh, no, I think reason. the plug needs to be there. Like it's a, <laughs> yeah, it, it needs to be there, yeah. and, and and I'll make sure the plug stays there. Uh, yeah. You know, th throughout <laughs> the whole eternity. Yeah. Is it yeah. a three point plug or a USB? Yeah. I think it's a USB. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it a Type C these days? Also true. Uh, type C, yeah, Type C. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, just going yeah. back, going back yes. onto what on the, I think everything is a TVET, unless. University is in its truest form is academia, right? It's philosophy, sure. it's going to lab for research, it's writing papers, it's, it's that kind of stuff. Everything else that, that, that hangs off university is actually technically, I would say, applied learning. And that's why for a lot, slowly the shift, people are beginning to, to, to see the shift that Tibet will make you job ready and life skills ready, right? Whereas university or going towards university pathway makes you university path, uh, ready. You know how to revise for exams. You know how to time your, your, yourself so that you can get your A's. But you actually in a work environment, that, that's really lacking. And a lot of subjects that, that people go to university for, there's arguably be better off in a Tibet environment. Yeah. If I can yeah. just jump in, right? So, so you do a lot of early child education work as well, right? And like, you know, with the kindergartens that you guys run, like how do yeah. you see like the, the sort of like the values you build there and how do you see that progressing throughout like a, a child's or an adult's journey? Like, I think um, that's a, quite a loaded question, but I think if they, they say, they say that, a lot of neurons are wired by the age of five. And if at the age of five, they're given um, time to, to have their own creative thinking skills, have their own um, play is, is, uh, is really supported. Uh, if they're respected, if they are allowed to be inventive, um, all this kind of stuff that we talk about now for 18 year olds, if we put that all into kindergarten, if, mm. or if their kindergarten was more like that, where instead of doing worksheets and phonic flashcasters and being uh, ready for primary school, we protect their childhood and let the, the, the simple curiosity of a child unfold in an unfettered um, environment um, fol following what they are interested in. Hopefully this will set the building bricks in their neurons so that as they go to primary and secondary school, which is very famous for killing creativity in a mainstream <laughs> environment, hopefully a little bit of that will still um, churn on, right? Mm. As, they, as they grow up and this ability to, to, to do what is right for yourself and what you think is it's good for you, you know? If that, if that kind of makes sense. No, you're right. Because yeah. it's the same things yeah. you speak about for adults. That is what we want, right? Um, yeah. yeah. That's a fantastic question, Rashmin. Thank, thank you for, for asking. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I guess I also need to uh, perhaps ask Dr. Powell again uh, an, another tough question. 
Uh, I, I always get the tough ones, right? So okay. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was pre-planned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Stakeholder engagement. You, you you talk about bureaucracy and 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 whatnot. Oh. Is is it lacking? Is it not non-existent, or is it there but it's just going around the bush? Hmm. <laughs> uh, on a good day, it's one of those three. On a bad day, it's all of those three. <laughs> Look, I, I want to be very honest with you. We have got some very, very brilliant people in the country working on yeah. Tibet. We do. We do have brilliant people working in the, con in the country, working for Tibet to bring up Tibet and to do the right things. Right? And, and they have got a lot of uh, knowledge and they've got a lot of engagements going on in the industry, but mm. their voices are not heard. Right? And for me, for example, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a private college and uh, there are times where, you know, I voice up my opinions and uh, we get shot down because, you know, it's either we're too ahead of time or we're not playing ball. Then mm -hmm. we branch out and we look for partners who understand the situation with us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we talk to, we talk to Hong Leong Foundation, we talk to Marika, right? Uh, we talk to other networks and, and uh, MSEAF. Uh, we talk to so many other networks and we try to connect with them and try to, try to explain to them, look, what we're trying to do here may be too advanced for the current uh, government to understand. Right? But it's not a total lost cause. Mm -hmm. You can trust us. We can do it for you. We can deliver it for you. You know? Uh, I believe that if there is an uh, industry taking a major stake as uh, the leaders in Tibet, we will see very fast and amazing changes very soon. So, so you're what, saying they are, they, are, they are industry ready people who will come in and support? Yes, yes. Okay. No, yes, Andrew, I can just yes, add to this, yes. Right? So, for example, like we have a good friend. Um, I hope he's tuning in. His name is Daniel Rahman. So he is actually involved in the National TVAT Council looking at branding, mm -hmm. right? So, so he's reached out and he's asked for like, hey, let's brainstorm a little bit, um, which we are super happy to do, right? And I really hope he's a fantastic guy. I hope he makes the right changes at the top. Now, mm -hmm. the question I ask about stakeholder engagement is what happens after that, right? So for example, um, in my humble context, social entrepreneurship, we have, I've probably filled up three to four surveys by the ministries on social entrepreneurship, context, what to do, what the challenges over the last two, three months, right? And these are long surveys. These are 15, 20 minute, half an hour surveys, right? And also been invited to many of these sessions. My question is, what happens to all these sessions? Yeah, what happens after that, you know? Yeah. Oftentimes, I don't hear back in the context of, hey, this is all the feedback we got. We are summarizing these eight points. We're going to act on these three points. If that comes out as a result of the stakeholder engagement, I bet you industry will be super excited because of course I know we'll ask, we'll give 10 feedbacks and maybe only two is feasible, but to know that two is being worked on is very empowering. So, so Yen, I, I don't mean to put you yes. on the spot, no. but, uh, but you ha are. has there been any <laughs> form of uh, engagement with uh, HLF and, and any of the stakeholders out there? Stakeholders as in companies? Uh, ministries, I, I suppose. Uh, has there been any HLF with the ministries? Uh, I suppose mm, I would, I would, because, okay, where do I start? Huh? <laughs> um, I suppose because of what, what we are doing, we are doing very much a pilot right we are um, creating a system and a flow and we can only do uh, what what we can do within the limits of our our pockets or within the limits of our reach right and we can what we can is showcase um, to the government this is what we've done and this is how we've worked on a small scale uh, with some of the Hong Leong group of companies of course and other companies as I mentioned we're always happy to take in more and this is how the pipeline that we have built and these are the 
uh, you know, we've done our baselining and this is where we've, we've, we've come and this is how the children, because we have soft skills as well and this is how they evolved and, and so on. We are a case study, you go ahead and you scale it because we, we, we have shown that it can work and the children are really um, wanting to learn and they, they, they are making impacts. And I think as um, a private sector, sort of uh, space with, 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 social, with the social space, that's as far as we can do. We can't move the yardstick and change laws and infrastructure. You know, mm -hmm. we can't piecemeally become Germany. Germany mm -hmm. is, a, <laughs> is a structure that the government has yeah. to impose, right? True. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I, I have perhaps one last question, uh, and maybe Rashwin, you, you can take this. Uh, there, there was a question from an audience, uh, a Mr. Shankar. Uh, he, he simply asked, uh, university students versus TVET student, who is more employable? And, and what are jobs are more suitable for TVET graduates? I thought we said Dr. Paul will do the tough questions. Uh, no, I... I <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Shankar, thank you for the question, Mr. Shankar. Yes, question, please. Okay, so, you know, honestly, I think, let's, I'll, I'll keep this concise, right? Because it's a huge, um, a loaded one, as, yeah. as you would say. Yes. Um, so, even at university students, like, some students are questioning the relevance of going to university, right? So, for example, we work very closely with Taylor's University. They are rebranding completely the way they run degree programs to include multidisciplinary learning so that students can do different electives. Students from there... I would say, yes, super employable because you could do a marketing course and then do an elective in engineering or design or even psychology, right? So there's full of great, so they come out not with a bachelor's, but they come out with a right thinking mind frame. Mm -hmm. Students from Tibet who also come up with that kind of skill set, there's the Taiping Tibet um, school that won a global competition for innovation. Yeah, so I yeah. don't think, Shankar, it's about Tibet or, or university. I think it's about the institution itself. And some institutions will produce gems, will produce, you know, um, flourishing students, and some will produce Microsoft 95, uh, Windows 95. <laughs> I'm a fan of Microsoft, though, just saying, just saying, like, 95 is an old software. Uh... <laughs> okay, and, and, and with that, I, I think we, we have uh, reached uh, the end of, of our session. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll let Dr. Paul. For, for you to close any parting thoughts? Uh, thanks, thanks, Andrew. Uh, actually, Tibet is not just for the youths, right? Uh, let me break it down here. It's also for the current employed uh, uh, workforce currently, right? They can also use their, their, their skills, their knowledge, and go up for a upskilling and reskilling program. Post pandemic, we do not know what hell is going to drop on us in the job market, right? What is going to happen? Uh, there's going to be a lot of unemployment, but we can sort these issues out if we start with a future worker program, right? So what we're doing currently is we, are, we want to promote the future worker program, right? You train your worker the way you want them to, right? And you take ownership and responsibility for that. And industries love it. They, they, they want to do it because they can see that the investment that they do is going to come back. And then the next question is, okay, what am I going to do with my current employees? Like, ma'am, sir, give them a chance, reskill and upskill them. Because that's the beauty about digital skills. Everybody uses it. Everybody knows it's there. It's just how you're going to conceptualize the thing and put it onto a platform for somebody to pick it up and learn. Mm. So that is, that is one of the most important things. It's, it's for everybody. TVET skills and upskilling, reskilling is for everybody. Uh, it's very important for us to look into currently in this today's world, I would say, is to, like what uh, Suyen said was, look at a child and see what the child wants. If it's not Oxford or Cambridge, it's okay. That doesn't mean he's going to be a total, you know, a, a no future kind of a kid. You know, mm -hmm. he, he or she might just be the next, you know, big thing or problem solver in the world. But we have to look into the child and give the child options, right? Is that education, innovation, what do you want to do? How do you want to proceed with that? And it's very important for the industry stakeholders to work with existing uh, and, uh, organizations, right? Social enterprises. I, 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 I'm not selling it. 
I used to give social enterprise a hard time, but <laughs> I used to give social enterprise a hard time, but I believe in the concept of what they do. They, they actually, they have got a better reach sometimes compared to all those people on the high top, right? So they have got a better reach and they can actually come in and tell you, okay, this is on the ground. This is the problem. This is how I'm going to solve it. Can I work with you? So we need to give uh, social enterprise organizations and, and some NGOs some importance to also voice out what do they think, how they can help in Tibet, how they can change things, right? Industry leaders, our people and our youth need to combine and talk. The private sector is very willing to help. And I'm, I'm just speaking purely from my, from my perspective, uh, from the many, many times I've spoken to people. Yeah, they are very willing to help. So, yeah. Hopefully, the future worker program that we are working on currently with HLF, it yields results and, 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 and you know, uh, the youths who are participating in this program, they will be able to be a statement of their own. Mm. You know, they will be able to go out there and say, you know, I have benefited from this program. You know, I was a blah, so and so and so. I didn't know what MIT app inventor is, but today, you know, I'm doing this. You know, today I'm mm -hmm. fixing a robotic arm. I'm solving problems. So, mm -hmm. yeah, things like that. I, I, believe, I, I, I believe very strong, sorry, I'm a very, very strong believer in skills. I believe that skills is a way forward for the very long time. It just depends on how you want to, how you want to adjust it, right? And uh, one kid can change an entire family's landscape. It's just the opportunity mm. that we want to give that person. Mm. Thanks, Andrew. Nice, nicely put, nicely put. Rashwin. Um, no, I think after Dr. Pal, it's a, it's a lot. Um, Pal said it, Pal put it very well. Um, no, I think, again, I'm super excited about, yeah, digitalizing Tibet. I'm super excited about the programs that we have because, honestly, this was dreams that we had, but to be able to apply it, not many people are willing to test out bold ideas. And we need yeah. bold ideas. We need people to try something that, you know, there is a chance of failure, but it's okay because as long as every failure yields two or three fresh upshoots, right? So yeah, I'm all about, I'm really glad that the three of us are here doing bold ideas together. And I wish everybody who's listening to this, go pitch back to your organizations to do something bold because that's what's going to bring a change. Um, yeah. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. And uh, Suyen, last words. I, I don't think I have much more to, to add to this. Um, maybe, maybe something on the, you know, just, just because you are poor, um, it doesn't mean you don't have a choice and, mm. and that you can't make choices. There are choices out there and that's what we hope to be able to, to give you. So we don't, don't feel like your doors is only closed and you only can be this or, or that, you know, the whole world is at your feet. Yeah. True. That's True. Great. Uh, with with that uh, lady, the lady and the gentleman in the in in the Zoom room, I, I thank you once again on on behalf of uh, Rejuvenate Edition to 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 be spending time and having this fantastic discussion to today. I, I think there's there are lots of takeaways. Uh, there there are lots uh, that we we can learn from, and and I and I do hope uh, there are stakeholders that are listening to this. Uh, otherwise. Rashwin, me and you on the site, we, we will forward it to the relevant people and, and, and make sure they've <laughs> heard what uh, Dr. Pal and what Suyen has to say as well. Uh, but again, once again, um, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Uh, we we do you, appreciate it, uh, uh, your time this thank morning. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you for no, having us. No problem. Most welcome. And, and, and with that, uh, to, to our audience, we, we've got a full day of events today. Uh, next up, we have at 12.45 would be Chape One Sarima Ibrahim. Uh, I, I think all of us who are in the same generation would remember her from, from uh, a very different kind of a show, but she is today the patron of the Mental Illness Awareness and Support Association Malaysia, MIASA. Uh, and, and we will be talking about uh, things like um, how, how can we uh, future-proof our youth in terms of uh, getting ready for the new norm in terms of the workforce, right? So we, we hope you guys uh, do, do stay back and, and, and tune in uh, for our next session. Uh, and, and with that, we would like to say a big thank you once again and bye-bye to Dr. Pal, Suyen, and Rashwin. Thank you, Andrew. And hope thank you have you. a good day. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.